Hi, this is Tom again from Wanderos, and welcome to our second vlog going over our progress in Pandemonium's yet unnamed successor. Through this video you'll be hearing some of the music that Tommy Goff has been producing for the game in the background, and there are many more tracks to come, so look out for that in the future. We're going to be starting off by focusing on the new art direction for the game. Much of the style we've been building towards now has been defined through some of the early concept and texture work by our artist James. Our goal was to create a consistent visual style that works well between different environments, themes and moods. Given the top-down camera of the game, we have focused on large forms over small details and we're really happy with where we've got it going from here. The various pieces you see here are for the Asian level set that we've now almost finished. The individual models you see here can and will be split up into modular assets that allow us to reuse them in new and fresh ways between a number of areas. The gong asset here, for example, can be split into six different pieces for use elsewhere, but the plan is to also use them together in a set as an interactive item. This Asian set theme will be used to recreate the original level and a few more levels uh, that we've got in the design phases at the moment. These rock variations were sculpted by our high poly artist Matthew and were textured cooperatively between James and Prisa. Something that we've discovered since finishing this set is that ours is a very stone heavy game, so it's likely that even this number of variations will be added to as we complete additional doodad sets. Much of the progress Matt has been making since the last video has actually been an entirely new unannounced environment that we should be able to show some more next vlog uh, sometime next month. Matt also assisted with the modeling effort for our paper lantern, textured here by Parissa. Because of the way that light comes from within these lanterns naturally through the paper itself, we needed to experiment with a new shader for the surface and how it treats light. Thankfully, Unity has an excellent community of developers who often share their work for free, and in this case we were able to utilize an existing shader which treats the areas we define for a grayscale texture as translucent. You can see here as we move the light around the scene that the light is picked up from within the inside of the lantern in addition to light hitting the outside. The shader was based upon a talk by DICE and created for Unity by James O'Hare. You can find the source code and a little bit of an explanation on the technique over on his blog at farfara.com. There will be a link in the description of this video to the specific blog in question. Another big part of creating this environment has been redefining the style and details of our trees and plants. Our original 48 hour assets were very simple and somewhat indistinct, so Parissa has been putting a lot of effort into getting our new vegetation to fit with the new model and texture styles. For the first time she has been experimenting with vertex normal modification, which basically is a method that allows you to make different intersecting planes that you would use for leaves and branches to blend more naturally together, rather than have different angles of light coming upon them and making them sort of stand out as artificial. The trunks and bushels have also been separated for each, allowing us to more easily modify the trees with simple variations to break up some of the repetition in the scene. We've also begun some work on particle effects with the vegetation to bring some movement and life to the scene, as you see here with the cherry blossom leaves and the bush bursting outwards as, as the armadillo moves through. This stuff is still in its very early stages though, and may not be returned to for some time while we get the broader assets and designs of the game in place. When Parissa hasn't been creating plants, she's been working on new tileable textures for the various terrain types we'll have in the game. At this time, with iterations of grass, dirt and rocks that we're quite happy with, and this will be massively expanded in time as we move over to new areas and settings. What you see here is a diffuse map, which defines the color, normal map, which provides surface detail for the way lighting hits the texture, and grayscale height map. The height map is actually very important for the new way which we're developing the terrain. I'll hand the explanation for that over to our programmer Alex, who's been creating that system. One of the big graphics pipeline features we've been working on is to do with our terrain systems. Unity's inbuilt terrain functionality, while allowing for a quick iteration on prototyping ideas, doesn't give us the flexibility that we were looking for in our game's terrain and it has some fairly lacklustre tools. What we wanted to do in place of this was to have our own measures that we could import into Unity and use as our terrain. One of the primary issues with this is how we were going to texture it. The traditional process of moving models into the game involves UV unwrapping, a tedious process of mapping a texture onto a mesh. But given that we didn't want to bog down a necessary and prevalent part of the game by repeating a time-consuming process for every iteration we wanted, we needed a system that would support this. What we came up with was a custom shader that allows us to put any mesh into the world and have it automatically map terrain textures onto it, as well as scale and tile these textures, even at the seams between separate meshes, completely arbitrarily. This allows us to simply modify the mesh at the source and then import directly into the game without worrying about textures or unwrapping at all, greatly speeding up our terrain iteration process. In addition to this, the shader uses triplanar projection mapping, allowing us to have terrain walls and overhangs sport a different texture, such as the rock walls shown in this video. 
as well as height blending, giving a much cleaner transition between textures in contrast to simply alpha blending the textures for an odd looking result. Note that our current terrain meshes are placeholders and will be improved and optimised when the level layouts have been finalised. As much of the work on the game has been on the back-end systems supporting it, not much has been done in terms of actual gameplay. But one of the features we have working now is character switching. By utilising separate character and AI systems, we can assign any character type to be controlled by a player or an AI bot. And through this, we can have player pandas and armadillos controlled by AI bots. While in the final version of the game, we intend for this to be used mostly for alternate player types with different abilities, the only other character we have right now is the panda, so we're going with that until we have a clearer picture of our alternate options. This will be a precursor to single player modes, as well as alternate game modes with varying players, AI and character combination. By far the biggest and most time consuming task so far has been our pathfinding system. Again, while Unity does have support for its own pathfinding through navigation meshes, it has some severe limitations that simply won't work with some of the ideas we have for newer levels going into the future. Newer releases of Unity that we have yet to upgrade to, as well as some of the community pathfinding add-ons for Unity, have solutions for some of these problems but still don't provide a complete system. We needed support for static navigation baking, as well as dynamic paths and dynamic obstructors. We've been building a system that solves all of these issues and allows us to build the levels and systems that we want. A dynamic obstructor will block parts of the navigation node graph, preventing an AI bot from pathing through an area, while dynamic paths will rebuild the graph around them, ensuring the bots take the correct routes around a level. Where initially we had some poor performance issues with this pathfinding, they have been vastly improved since we began development. Taking our most extreme instances, graph generation is down from 90 seconds to 2 seconds, loading is down to half a second from 9 seconds, and pathfinding and graph changes are now done in background threads. We still have some issues to attend to, but we're very quickly working through them and the pathfinding should be complete soon. Once it is, you'll see much more from us on the features side of things. And that's pretty much it for this month. So next month, you're going to be seeing, as you see in some of the previews here, we've got multiple environment types being worked on simultaneously now. So previously, while we were all working together to get this one Asian set theme down, we have enough of the base level of assets that we can start spreading out and creating various different environment types now, experimenting with that and mixing matching from there. We've also got a new panda character model coming on the way, so we've got a new artist working with us, uh, Glenn Cowley, who is sculpting a new panda for us. The panda and armadillo you've seen, obviously, are from the 48-hour game at the moment. These will all be replaced in time as we get the new assets in. We've also, if some of you are following us either on Facebook or Twitter, we had a game jam recently, and our idea was to stream the entirety of that through our design process in the beginning all the way through the various bits of work we put into it towards the end. At the end of the first day, however, we moved locations and were unable to stream the rest of the event, but we recorded them locally on each of our computers. So the compilation video for that is upcoming. It should be up before the next vlog is up. Uh, it's mostly done now. We just need to have a few extra tweaks. It took a little bit of time to get the multitude of hours down to the one video, but it's looking nice and should be up soon. We'll also have the game available for download. It will be called Wilhelm Scream. It should be up on our website sometime around the time the video is put up there, so look out for that. Stay tuned for these updates and more. If you want to have more of this stuff, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, at WildGrassGames, uh, Facebook.com slash WildGrassGames, or just search for us in the search bar. And of course, we have this blog on our website.